for joining us. Whether you watch on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, we are so blessed that you are a part of Prayer Nation. Thankful for our Australian and New Zealand friends. Uh, some of our New Zealand friends get up very early in the morning to join us live. We always are so blessed to have you. Thank you to all of our uh, islanders all around the, the world. Uh, we have islanders that connect with us, uh, speci uh, specifically uh, the, the Pacific Islands. We have a lot that join us from there. Thank you so much, whether it's Hawaii or Fiji or other islands. We are so blessed to have you with us. Uh, whether uh, you are close or whether you are far, whether English is your first language or a second language, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, we are feeling so many things in the spirit right now, and we are trying to do our best to, again, pull apart the spirit world and make sense of it. Discerning of spirits is to distinguish between. We want to know what is what. And so, we have all four of these categories that are present with us all the time, and this is why mastery in the spirit is so important, why we must understand the impulses uh, and actions that are uh, coming out of us just in the same way that it's coming out of other individuals and how collectively that affects culture, how it affects the church, how it affects uh, even governments and government mindsets, economics, and uh, different generations, how the different generations respond and react to uh, various stimuli. So all of these things are really important for us uh, to try to, uh, to really understand how to pray effectively. Our number one goal is to always pray the will of God. This is our all, always our number one goal. So and today we are getting in position just like I'm lowering my chair just a little bit. We're getting in position today so that we can really move the kingdom of God forward and advance the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ. His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So let's begin with our prayers of alignment and prayers of rhythm. Let's ask God uh, to completely consume us today so that we will be able to have clarity in, in discerning uh, the, the mind of God, the will of God, and the voice of God so that all of these other influences will be put in their proper place. So all of the the, the abundance of things that are uh, constantly trying to get us to get on their frequency. Instead, we're the one that decides where the dial uh, stops, where, uh, where the frequency tuning in, what are we tuning into, uh, what are we tuning out of, how are we uh, ref refreshed and renewed in the presence of God to again say, God, I'm hearing you and I know what I need to do. And then I am being obedient. Are you ready? So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your abundant grace that is resting upon us. We thank you for the timing of God. We thank you for the will of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you give us grace to do your will. You give us truth, O oh God, to be transformed. I thank you, Father, for these great spiritual initiatives that you've given us, these strategic initiatives for the global church. I thank you for visitation that's happening right now, that you are sending us into your harvest field. I thank you, Father, that you are pulling out all the stops for the harvest to be reached. Father, I thank you for transformation, that there is a maturing process that's going on within the body of Christ and within many uh, men and women of God that you are raising up right now. You are accelerating that purpose within them as they are maturing in your grace. And now, Father, we thank you for multiplication, that you have ultimately blessed us with this as our divine directive to be fruitful and multiply. And so as the earth has been filled with people, now it is time to fill your earth. Oh God, to fill the earth with your glory. It is time for an outpouring upon all flesh, that there would be multiplication, oh God, entering into the church again, even more than it was starting in Acts 6. So Lord, we thank you for this visitation, transformation, 
and multiplication. We pray right now that you would open up our hearts. Now let's pray in Jesus' name, spirit, soul, and body prayers. Are you ready? God, we're coming to you in the name of Jesus. We want your presence to be manifest in our lives. We want you to to shine out of our faces. We want you to smile, oh God, through our through our smile, shine out through our eyes, be heard in our words, be felt in our touch. We want to have the fragrance of God that comes up, that that comes up uh, before the world. That the fragrance that we leave behind the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. That the fragrance of the anointing would rest upon us that you may receive the glory, that we may taste and see that the Lord is good and that you would temper our appetites, oh God, that you would cause our appetites to taste the things of God, to taste the miraculous, to taste, oh God, the heavenly, to taste the kingdom, to taste and see that the Lord himself is good, that we would feed on you. We would feed that you are bread, that you are meat, Oh God, you are water. You said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part. We want to feed on who you are, not in some strange uh, cannibalistic or extreme viewpoint of literalism, but there was a symbolic understanding there that we were to feed on the nature of Christ, on who he is. I pray, Lord, we would have your heart, that we would be like you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Maharakahim, Mahalaka ila maha ese. Unbre eje dolo mahakatim. That we would have your mind, that our will would be fashioned like unto your will, that our souls would be redeemed before you. So, inasmuch as we give you our spirit, soul, and body today, that you would shine out of our bodies, that our five senses would be crucified with you and then transformed. And in the same way that our mind would be transformed, that our hearts would be transformed, that our will would be transformed, that our emotions would be miracle emotions. So, in the same way, let our spirit, man, oh God, let it be completely connected, engaged, overwhelmed made one, oh God, in Christ. We thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to overflow. Let it flow out of us like rivers, Lord. Rivers, Lord. Rivers, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We need to go to the next level, Father. We feel that urgency to go to the next level. We pray for this right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to strap on the armor with me right now. Are you ready? Let's do this. We're praying the whole armor of God. Uh, Pray it in concert with me. We take our loins girt about with truth. We take on the breastplate of righteousness. I'll say it with me. The feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god the rhema word of god now let's worship together thank you lord i worship you jesus i worship you jesus i bless the name of the lord hallelujah hallelujah jesus hallelujah jesus i worship you lord I worship you, O oh God. I worship you, O oh God. This morning, the only way that I could describe what I what I was sensing in the spirit was the trembling awesomeness of God, the fear of the Lord, trembling in the reality that he is in charge, knowing that He doesn't always do what I want, but he always does what is right. It's not always my preference, but it's always best. Every time I have seen him rule, when he makes a decision, when he rules, I have seen him rule about life and death, and his choice overrode overrode mine. I wanted life, he chose eternal life. But there had to be a death 
in this world for eternal life to be gained in that world which is to come. And in eternity now, there have been times when God has absolutely answered my prayers and I was in perfect sync with him and I've seen cancer healed in a second. I witnessed people that could not walk, that had to be carried into the building and in Brazil just jump, jump out into the aisle and start dancing, coming down to the altar at the end of the service and uh, they're all smiling and pointing at the legs and I'm thinking somebody's knees were healed and they were like, no, they couldn't walk at all and they're jumping and dancing. I've seen that. But I've also seen times when we wanted so desperately to pull someone out of a wheelchair, so much wanted someone to jump up and walk and something was missing, a component was missing. And it seemed that, that there was a block there are times when it's our faith. There are times when it's demonic. There are times when it's mentalities. And then there are times when it's simply God's will. When I think about America and I think about the global church and I think about the prophetic words that God has spoken to me and I feel the if, not in God's corner, but the, but the if in my corner and in our corner, I tremble. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. If you will, I will. The if is not with God, the if is with us. There was a man that came to Jesus and said, if you can do anything, have compassion. And Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible. The if is not with Jesus, the if is with us. I feel that trembling presence of God today because I know that there is an election that is already going on right now. Early voting is already happening in America and I feel the ramifications of all of these agendas and I say, God, what agenda are you going to allow? Who are you going to allow to be raised up? And who is going to be sat down? Who is going to win and who is going to lose? Because on the other side of that Tuesday, on the other side of next Tuesday, we are going to see the direction of America, and we're going to immediately have to adjust. Will there be a reprieve? Even if we see a conservative president back in the White House, again, the, the rousing of so many opposition forces, divisive hate speech, uh, constant um, uh, banter, that has one specter to it. On the other side, if we get a, a, a liberal, we are going to have a far left liberal that's going to very quickly uh, turn America um, into uh, a very secular uh, place that is very compliant with the global agenda. And the advancing of the Antichrist system and the Antichrist spirit will be much faster than I think any of us really want to admit. So we feel the weight of this, but God, what do you want? You see, God does not rule about our comfort. He's not ruling in our favor because he wants us all to just relax he is looking at this from the perspective of harvest. And so we ask the question today, how close are we to the end? How close are we to the end? We see BRICS coming up, an anti-West, anti-American alliance with Russia and China playing huge roles as well as India being right in the center of this. 
It's literally the I in the middle of bricks, B-R-I-C-C-S. Uh, um, an invitation now for Saudi Arabia to join. What does this mean? Saudi, Saudi is on the edge. It's on the, it's on the fence. Uh, what is going to happen? We have already uh, an increased anti-Semitic uh, view that's rising on our campuses here in the United States and around the world. Uh, Pro-Palestinian, uh, the propaganda is very, very strong. And uh, there is this, this two-edged sword of Israel. Is that on one side, there is the biblical uh, Israel. There's the biblical uh, Jewish people, their DNA still is in the world. And then there are the covenants that were made to the patriarchs, that were made to the nation of Israel, that the church is very much in alignment with because it's the word of God. And because we read, you know, Romans 9, 10, and 11, we understand that the Gentile church would not exist if the Jews were not taken away. Um, we are grafted into that vine as a wild olive branch. And Paul said, if it was good for the falling away of the Jews to create the Gentiles, how much more will their gathering back together be? We also know that God raised up America for the sake of the Jews. And then we also know from our own prophet T.W. Barnes that Jesus told him to pray for the Jews when he had no interest in the Jews and his theology didn't even accommodate the Jews until after the rapture. And so it changed his whole trajectory and subsequently all of us who have uh, been influenced by him now understand the importance of praying for Israel. The scripture says to pray for Jerusalem, prosperity for Jerusalem, peace in her walls, strengthen the bars of her gates. It says you shall prosper that love thee, so we are to pray for Israel. Then there is the second side of this. The other, the other side of Israel, which is the Antichrist movement that is facilitated through these who have rejected Jesus, have no interest in Christianity, and actively work against Christianity, work against the new covenant, and have, as a result a very different view of the world. And these who may, you may want to call Zionists, and not all Zionists are evil, but many of them within that particular uh, thought process are very globalist in their agenda. They're very, um, very secular, and uh, they see the world through a very different lens. When you consider the Illuminati families and who they are, do your research and you'll find out how many of them go right back to the seed of Abraham. Uh, Ishmael, uh, the people of Ishmael are still in existence. The pure line of Ishmael has been protected and preserved. And what happens is people who know these things and hear their conversations, uh, they see how dominant they are and so they want to push back against them and say these on one hand are uh, uh, an oppressed and victimized people, the Holocaust, and then on the other hand, there's another element of them which are global dominant forces that uh, control everything. And so this is a two-edged sword and our job is just simply to pray and ask God for his will to be done and to decipher between what is righteous and unrighteous, what is godly and ungodly, what is just blindness and a veil over their heart, and what is Illuminati, what is darkness, what is antichrist, what is demonic, what is evil. And so this creates this this constant struggle uh, in the Middle East because there are forces there that are uh, also seeking to be dominant. Uh, the battle between religions, between Islam and Judaism, um, and then sometimes Islam and Christianity, 
uh, these things are also real. And there is this global caliphate that the Islamic community wants. And then there is this messianic kingdom that we're all praying for. Uh, that is not necessarily a theocracy yet. That's in the millennial reign. But something that is uh, a nation that would fear God and be righteous and stand upon the principles of God's word and allow uh, disciples to make disciples and that the nations would literally be discipled as Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, go into every nation. And then we see in Matthew chapter 24 that this gospel, the kingdom will be preached unto all nations and that's all ethnos, all ethnos because borders of nations and names of nations change, but ethnicities are the same. And he says, every ethnic group is going to be reached before the end. So you think about all of the things in these texts that Jesus said about the end of the world, uh, both in Luke and in, and in Matthew where they are recorded. When you think about the writings of Paul, when you see the book of Revelation, when you understand Daniel, so many things are pointing towards these end time uh, signs. Uh, they're saying the signs of those things, they are among us, they are all around us. And yet how close are we truly to the end? Going back to my original premise, my original thought of trembling in the presence of God, the one thing that is on the mind of Jesus more than anything else. Even more uh, than peace in the world. The number one thing is Jesus died for every soul. Palestinian, Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, you name it, Jain, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Catholics, Baptists, atheists, every stripe, every, every color, every soul, Jesus died for every single one of them. This is the drive behind my book, and this is the drive behind the revelation knowledge of visitation, is that we are at the 11th hour. But what did Jesus emphasize? In the one time, the 11th hour, is mentioned in scripture one time, one parable, one specific moment of grace, a final visitation of God to the marketplace. What is it for? I have a vineyard that I want to harvest before the sun goes down. And I need laborers. I need harvesters. The early church had such a fervor, had such a fervor for evangelism that they thought not their lives dear unto themselves. The apostle Paul did not even flinch when every person that prophesied to him about going to Jerusalem said that he would be bound and imprisoned. And he says, I'm ready. I'm ready to be offered. There's nothing in me that is better than, any, than anyone else. I'm ready to be given. I'm ready to be offered. Thank you for the sentiment. I appreciate the respect. Thanks for the kindness. But it doesn't matter. All that matters. What happens to me, Paul says, doesn't matter. Well, all that matters is the gospel. This gospel being preached in all the world for a witness. This is my burning passion today. This is what I feel so intensely in the spirit is the heart of God is about the harvest, is that Jesus died for everyone. Something must happen in the world to get the world's attention. 
Something must to shake people from their foundations. All that can be shaken will be shaken. The shaking is to, is to get them to stop trusting in the ways of man, stop believing the lies, stop doing what they have always done, stop thinking the same thoughts that they have always thought. The shaking is for them to consider something else, someone else, to be open, to hear on a different frequency and not just listen to the droning of the channel that they were born with. It is better to pray than to sleep. The minuets in the morning in the Muslim culture uh, getting on their faces every, uh, every day, five times a day. How are you going to get them out of that? What's going to shake What's going to shake the billion Muslims in the world? <laughs> what about the Jews dobbing and doing their prayers and doing all the things that they do on the wailing, at the Wailing Wall and the Jews everywhere? I've seen them get up on planes, put on their phylacteries on planes, wrap it around their arm and put it around their head, put their prayer shawls on and stand it stand in the open place where the where the door is and dobbin up on a plane because it was sabbath in israel what gets them out of that what opens up their mind what takes the veil off their heart what about all the people that are disillusioned by christianity disillusioned what about the catholics that are stuck in their rosaries and praying their hail marys and what about all the good uh, evangelicals out there that have been told that because they've confessed the lord that everything is fine and yet they know something is there's something more that's there there's something more that that they need and and and, and you see these these little blips of uh, of revivals that are happening and things that are beginning to ground swell and the urgency that is coming. And then you have the Pentecostal charismatic movement that is driving in prayer and intercession and spiritual warfare. And then we have a whole generation of disillusioned young people that are in no category at all. They're in the none. They chart the box. Which, which faith are you? Are you Hindu? Are you Buddhist? Are you and they just marked the box, none. This is the largest category in America now. We don't know the stats from around the world because every country would be a little bit different, but this rise of secularism, secular humanism, science and so-called and evolution and all of the LGBTQ+, plus, which creates a barrier and a boundary purposely against uh, Christians trying to take people that might be sympathetic and then making them question their identity and then for that moment now makes them reject the church because it tells them that the church is bigoted and biased and, and uh, you know, filled with hate and homophobic. What is it going to take? This is what Jesus is driving at. Pestilences and famines and wars and the end is not yet. Why? Because... We haven't seen the harvest yet. So my prayer today, something has to push through all of the barriers. Something has to get past all of those preconceived ideas. Something has to get past the traditions. Something has to take place in the world. There needs to be signs and wonders and miracles. God is taking all of these things in 2024 that we have heard and they are all compounding repentance and alignment is compounding with putting Jesus in the center and the restoring of the glory is compounded with angels being sent forth uh, into the church for healings and miracles and signs and wonders is compounded with with backsliders coming home prodigals returning souls being saved and evangelism and evangelistic fervor being stirred and nets being cast and then an army being built and territory being being taken and music being written and lives getting into lives being changed and souls getting into the cadence of the spirit something has got to happen when zion travailed when zion travails she brings forth there's a point in all of this where it's not about the devil anymore 
It's about us coming to full maturity. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Let's stop and pray right now. Jesus, we must go to the next level. We must, oh God. We must, oh God. We must, oh God. Something has got to change. Something has got to shift. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Can you feel this passion right now? Can you feel the heartbeat of Jesus right now? We build a case. We build a case for God. We build a case for God. But what I have seen is that every time that there is a change, we're going to talk about this in our second segment in just a moment here. But every time there is a significant change is that there is a divine restlessness. There's something that happens within you that says, I cannot remain the same. There is a resentment almost of ourselves. There is a a pushing back against mediocrity, a shaking off of complacency, a renewal of our passion and our fervency. There's something in us that says, I've got to be better, that my good is not good enough, that my prayers are not effective enough, that I'm not fasting the way I should fast. And I'm not doing this in guilt. I'm not talking about this in the sense of, some kind of uh, legalistic driving away and uh, of saying that we have to try to earn uh, our salvation or our earn our next level. I'm saying that flesh is flesh, is flesh, is flesh, is flesh. It always chooses the easiest path. So today, I feel something in my soul. Oh God, the church must arise. The intercessors must arise. Every man of God must arise. It's time to put on our armors. It's time to go to war. The Lord said in the fourth quarter, he was assembling an army and he was sending us out. He's sending us with authority. Now is the time to fight. Now is the time to war. Now is the time to yearn in the spirit. Now is the time to press. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Every man presses his way in. We press our way into this next dimension. We press our way in to the higher calling We press our way into experiencing the kingdom of God in ways that we've never experienced it before so that we can lay hold upon tools, new resources that heaven is releasing to us so that our mindset is right, so that our default setting is changed and we think the way God wants us to think now. Ah, ah, there's a groaning within us. The Bible says groanings, which cannot be uttered. I want you to, if you're in a position to do this right now, I want you to just get, get in a position. If you need to get on the floor, get on the floor. If you need to stop just listening uh, because you're watching dishes and stop washing dishes right now while you're listening, maybe you're on your lunch hour. Many people watch on your lunch hour. If you can take five minutes and step out and go sit in your car or sit outside if it's a beautiful day, find a corner somewhere. If you're in your house and you're watching this right now, or maybe you need to say, you know what, I will do and do this later. I will, 
I will find a place later. I want to encourage you that we're going to pray some prayers. Maybe if you're watching this later, you can just pause it. You can even pause it if you want to after this little season of prayer that I'm going to institute right now. You can even push a pause on it and take an extended time. But I believe that God is moving us into this birthing, a birthing in the spirit. Let's pray together. Let's move into this place of travail. We yearn for you, God. We yearn, oh God. We yearn, oh Lord Jesus, that the the lethargy will be removed. The mediocrity will be addressed. The luke, lukewarmness, oh God, will no longer be who we are. We pray in the name of Jesus, you would renew our passion for worship. Renew our passion for your presence. Renew our desire for you and nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just, I just want you. Nothing else, as the song says, nothing else. Nothing else but you, Lord. I just, I just want you. Lord, we want souls. The souls that you died for. We want what you want. Let our hearts beat one with your heart. Let our spirit, oh God, be filled with fresh fire. Baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It's got to be more. Something more has to happen, God. It has to be more than what I can do. More than what these who are praying with me can do, but not, oh God, impossible. Not impossible anymore. Impossible, impossible does not exist when we're with you, when we're talking about what you can do. Turn America, oh God. Turn this generation, Lord. Turn our college campuses, oh Lord. Turn, oh God, these who are stuck in their pleasure seeking. Turn these who are stuck in their bitterness. Turn, oh God, a people, a generation that is blinded, oh God, by their own offenses. Deliver us, oh God, from evil. Deliver us from evil, oh God. <laughs> uh -huh. If you're, if you live in another country besides America, I want you to open up your heart right now. If you're an aimer, you're a missionary. If you're uh, an expatriate, or maybe you're a native of your nation, I want you to name the name of your country right now, and I want you to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ah, We pray for the nations, O oh God. We pray for the nations, O oh God, today. We yearn, O oh God, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Asia. We yearn for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, O oh God. In the southern hemisphere, Lord Jesus, Africa, South, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, oh God, Indonesia, the islands, oh God, we pray, Lord Jesus, for the equator, uh, equatorial nations, oh God, 
We pray for the northern hemisphere, Lord Jesus. We are yearning, oh God. We're yearning, oh God. For the Middle East, we're yearning, oh God. We're yearning for Europe, oh God. For Canada, for America, for Mexico, for Central America. Oh God, we are praying in Jesus' name that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. Oh God. For this Alpha City's revival, oh Lord. For this Alpha City's outpouring. For this Alpha City's visitation, oh Lord. For this last day, oh God, pour out your spirit, oh Lord. Pour out your spirit. Draw the backsliders back, O oh Lord. <laughs> Release them from their chains of darkness. Release them from their deception. Release them from their church hurt. Release them, Lord Jesus, from their addictions. Release them, O oh God, from their perversity. Deliver them, O oh God, I pray. Let something awaken the prodigals in their pig pens, O oh God, and bring them home. <laughs> Change the hearts of your people today, oh God. Change the hearts of leaders, influencers, oh God. Intercessors, change our hearts, oh God. Teach us, oh God. Deliver us, oh God, from ourselves, from our own unbelief, from our own traditions. Deliver us from the spirit of Jezebel that is manipulated and constantly kept there to be church problems so that we are not focused on the right things. Help us, O oh God, now to train, to develop, to raise up, to come to maturity. For you said, Lord, you spoke it so, so plainly that you are waiting for the church to come to maturity. And then you will give us these promises that we have so longed for. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Uh, 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 uh. There's just a groaning in the spirit right now. Just a groaning in the spirit. If you can feel God's presence taking you deeper right now, lift your hands to the Lord and just give him praise and thank him for it. Maybe give me a, a thumbs up or a heart or an amen so we can know that you're experiencing this right now, that you're feeling this right now, that God is moving on you, that you are feeling that same restlessness and that energy and passion is breaking through right now. We, we want to know. Hallelujah. We want to see that confirmation. Let the global church respond right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I can tell you that the highest level of praying is what's mentioned in, in the first order, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks. The law of first order says supplications is the highest. What that means, supplications means that it's prayer with tears. And what we have learned is that prayer with tears gets stronger and stronger until it leads to travail. Why it's the highest level is because you cannot travail, truly travail every day. You could pray until you cried every day. You could bring tears to your eyes every day. But travail, you do not travail every day. You do not give birth every day. But we're feeling that, that birthing of something in the spirit because when you birth something, you never go back. You never go back. You are never the same. I remember a distinct time when I was, I think, um, 18 or 19 years old. I cannot exactly remember the year. I'm sure someone could go back and find that because of the times when Vesta Mangan preached loving the way Jesus loves. That was the year. I think it was 88 or 89 um, when she preached that. And I heard that message, 
and I was new into the South. I didn't know very many people at Because of the Times. I was um, uh, just in the middle of the pew, not sitting with anybody that I knew. Um, and uh, I felt such a burning in my soul that I had to love the way Jesus loves. It was one of my lifetime goals. I had been studying the love of God, and now to hear Vesta Mangan, loving the way Jesus loves. Do you love the way Jesus loves? Oh, just loving the way Jesus, and with the whole message was that, that, that voice, that, that cadence, that heart, that compassion, countless hours of prayer, countless years of just loving people and reaching and winning and yearning for souls and oh, I could feel it in her and I was afraid to go forward I was afraid to get out of the pew people were starting to come forward in the altar and a hand hit my back and I turned around and everybody had already left the pews I had my eyes closed and I was praying and when I opened my eyes there was nobody around me an angel of the Lord had, had hit my back. And I knew, now I have to go. It was just like someone said, like, whack, get up and go. And I stood up, and when I stood up, I, I just started heaving. And by the time I got halfway down the aisle, I just collapsed on the carpet. At the end of those first set of, of pews, they have chairs now, and I just laid on the floor in the aisle. And I could not get up until I had travailed. I, I did not have words. I broke blood vessels in my face and my eyes. I travailed so hard. But I can tell you this. When I got up, something had changed. I believe that this is the groaning that is happening right now in the spirit. Is that God is taking us, taking us to a place that when we cross this, when we cross over into this, we will never go back. This is what he means when he says, let us labor. Could labor mean not just work? Could labor mean let us labor to enter into that rest? Could labor mean birthing? As a woman goes into labor, that we birth this third dimension of grace, that we cease from our own works, that the birthing is to get us past this stage of being out of the world but not totally in to the promises, that wilderness staging area, that something happens, something changes in us, and then something happens through us because he can trust us more. Could that be what labor means here? Could there be another layer of meaning in those words? I can tell you that there are things in the spirit right now that God is wanting to change, that must change. I made this dedication uh, in my uh, acknowledgments uh, in my book. I made this dedication to Brother Stone King. It was his message, Why We Must Have Revival that message still of all the messages that he preached and there were so many that that em emboldened me encouraged me gave me revelation knowledge made me celebrate worship dance cry lay on the altar every emotion possible i think the whole gamut has been experienced when he was directly uh, mentoring me and i was in so many of his meetings but this one, why we must have revival, embodied the fervency of reaching our generation, why we had to pray and fast. And he talked about it at the end of this message. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. And he said, I determined, Brother Stone King said, I determined that the devil would not have anything in me. And I said, Jesus, drag out whatever doesn't belong, drag it out of me so the devil can have nothing on me, so I can tear the devil's kingdom down, and so we can have revival. And I remember laying on the floor, hearing that message, 
I remember laying on the floor. He came and preached it in the church that I was attending at that time up in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, in Parkway. I had heard him on tape uh, preach similar messages, but this was in person. I went over by the exit doors way on the other far side of the church, way from the altar areas towards the front, but there was exit doors in the sanctuary. And I got in that little in that little opening there and I got on my face because I didn't really want anyone to see me. And I laid and trembled and travailed. And he found me and put his hands on me and started praying over me and prophesying over me. And something was imparted that day. And I still feel that fervency now after all these years. We must have revival. We must have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we must facilitate this visitation. A visitation is even greater than revival. Would you lift your hands one more time and would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. It must happen, Lord. Every church, every church, oh God. Every church in every city, oh God. Every pastor, every preacher, every saint of God, every teacher, every evangelist, every prophet, every apostle, oh God. Oh God, it must, we must, we must, we must. Ah, we must, Jesus, we must, we must, we must, we must, something must happen. We pray it, oh God, today. I pray it, oh God, today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, send the fire. Send the Holy Ghost fire. In the name of Jesus, send a river, oh God, of the Holy Ghost. If that's what we need is a river, then send a river, oh God. Oh God, pour it out, Lord Jesus, pour it out. In the name of Jesus. Something must happen, oh God. Something must change in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give him praise right now. Hallelujah. All right, we have a couple more components of this last section that I would like to try to get to. Uh, changing our default. Now, there are some things that you cannot understand until you get into the same season. There are some things that my dad in his season was dealing with that trickled down to me, uh, but I was in a different season. And so I saw them, I felt them, I benefited from the anointing that came out of that suffering. I benefited from the glory that was released from his pain. Uh, I, I, I was influenced by the strength um, of his leadership and by the depth of his conviction. I felt his unwavering authority. Uh, and so those things were the things that I needed as a generation after him uh, to be established and to be strengthened. But some of the mentalities that were intermingled with those powerful elements of who he was and who that generation is and remains, uh, what, is, what is left of it, what was brought to us. Now I am in the same season. Now I am in my 50s, just as my dad was in his 50s when he imparted things to me when I was in my teens and 20s. So now I am stepping into the same season that he was in and now I understand some of the processing from a seasonal standpoint that I did not understand as much or as good as, uh, or, or was even necessary because I was, I was in a different de developmental stage. So the idea is going from Elijah to Elisha is that we are to start where they end, that we are to supersede. And this is what my dad cast the vision for. You must go beyond me. Your son must go beyond you and his son after him. This is what Brother Stonking even imparted to me is saying, I want you to go beyond me. I don't want you to have anything that I impart to you that is going to be a hindrance to you. We talked a lot about things that were imparted from generations and different others uh, that were mentoring and being mentored. Uh, we talked about it very openly, Brother Stonking and I did. And so I think it's important for us to understand how impartations happen and... Uh, 
And we have to receive from the Spirit everything that God wants minus the limitate, limiting beliefs of the man from ho whom they came. Notice what Elijah said to Elisha. This is a hard thing. What you're asking for is a hard thing because it was beyond him. It felt hard to Elijah because it was beyond him. And yet the spirit said to him, but tell him this, if you see me when I go, it'll happen. So his humanity said, I'm, I'm maxed and you're asking for more. I don't see beyond this. He wasn't supposed to see beyond because he was about to go to heaven. So that was the end of the man, but now not the end of the ministry. The Holy Spirit through him says, but if you see me when I go. And how hard was it? <laughs> An angel on a chariot separates between Elijah and Elisha, blows between them. <sighs> and Elisha could have, put his eyes on the chariot, but instead he turns his eyes to Elijah. And that was the only point. See the man, watch the man go up, watch the laws of nature be overrode, watch the whirlwind that takes a man from here and carries him to there. And then here comes a mantle falling down. And he grabs the mantle and he goes back to the Jordan River. And he says, I know what to do. I've watched him do it. This is how you fold it. And this is how you throw it. Where is the God of Elijah? And the waters part. I've got it. My prayer is answered. I have a double portion. This is what God wants us to do as a generation right now. He wants us to get past the men and let the ministry and the mantle release a double portion. This happens in the spirit, impartations, revelation knowledge, but something internally goes with it. There's a mentality that shifts. And I'll give you one example. The Lord said to me, when you have deficiencies, the idea of rest means recovery only. But when your deficiencies are gone, and you're living in the overflow. Rest then now is the release of creativity. It is the better understanding of vision that in a state of rest, it is not a ceasing from your work in the sense that you just have to take a break even though you know so much more needs to be done and you feel guilty for taking a break because the obligation and the burden and the responsibility and people could die while you're taking a break or souls could be lost or things could be, plates will stop spinning or gaps will form or people will be let down or, but I'm sorry, I just pushed myself so far, now I'm in the hospital or I pushed myself so far, I have to sleep or, I, no, that's, that's the Elijah generation. Elisha is operating in a double portion anointing where he is empowering so many people and he lives with such a sense of abundance. When the Syrians get around the wall, he just goes, oh, yeah, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Don't be afraid. Are you serious? Are you kidding? Like, what is going on? You can't be serious. Look at how many armies are against us. We're in a small little walled city. Oh, sorry. Open his eyes, Lord, that he can see. No stress. The young man starts to see. <gasps> Behold, 
this is a change, a total change. It's warfare. Uh, there, there's no, there's no um, delay. There, there, there's no stress because he is walking in something. He's walking in an entirely different mentality. In the seventh chapter of Second Kings, now after they feed those Syrians that he captures through those two simple prayers that he prays in chapter six, with the help of the angel armies and blindness, he feeds them, they go home, then they come back and siege the city. Now the king is mad because he should have let him kill him. And he says, no, you're not going to kill him. And he says, now I'm going to kill you. And he's coming to the door and, and Elisha says, oh, uh, the king's sending somebody to kill me. He said, he wants to take my head. He said, hold him at the door, tell him I got a word tomorrow about this time. Measure a fine um, flour for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. What? Impossible. Nope. Nothing's impossible. Next day, there's a stampede of so many people going out because there's so much abundance. I mean, the, the, the connection to abundance, the connection to the angelic, the connection to the kingdom, it's so high. But there was a total default difference. His default was different. Rest is not an end to advancement. It is actually an acceleration because I'm no longer operating in deficiencies. I'm now operating in abundance. So things happen faster. And I take regular Sabbaths because God has a rhythm that he wants us to operate in and a constant reminder of our need to trust, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Not by might, Egypt. Not by power, wilderness. But by my spirit, Canaan land. Rest. Trust. Trust the Holy Spirit. And we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. We serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is it. So I pray that today God is shifting those defaults in you in spite of all the shaking that's going on in the world. And I pray in Jesus' name that his peace which passes all understanding will guard your heart and guard your mind. All right, as we close out our broadcast today, good news about the book. Uh, the website is up and ready and running. It's lightyourmatch.com. We're shipping books. We've shipped them out this week. I'm excited. Thank you so much for all of the orders that have already come in. We're a Pro Nation family. We do not ship internationally as of yet, and I apologize for that. We're working on a solution for this. Uh, shipping is included in the purchase of a book. Uh, the ebook is probably the best uh, option for you. We're making sure now that we can receive international uh, payment. Uh, we That came up yesterday. We had not had anybody try until I guess yesterday. Someone from Canada was trying. Um, we assumed that uh, the gateway would receive international um, uh, currency or it would just make the conversion for you. Um, but we do have the ebook. That's the goal of the ebook is that it would help the international community. Uh, the easiest, we're going to try to bring books with us to DCD when I go uh, uh, to Malaysia um, in December in a month. We're trying to get some books there, uh, get, get it started there. But uh, thank you so much for our global community and your interests. And uh, we're going to do our best to try to help find other solutions, other ways of making this happen, maybe using PayPal. Uh, but uh, it's going to happen. But for those that are in America uh, that have been waiting and wanting to know, yes, the website is up, lightyourmatch.com. For other resources, uh, jasoncisco.org is now up and running. Uh, so we're very thankful for all of the support, for all of our partners. God bless you. We love you. And we look forward to connecting with you very soon. We may have a special election edition, uh, Prayer Nation, uh, Monday or Tuesday, rather than doing it on Wednesday. We'll see as we get closer. But we love you. God bless. And remember, don't stay in the shadows, but stand in the light. Because with Jesus, it's always high noon. <laughs>